You should be seeing my browser now. I am. Okay. Oh, that looks right. that looks nice. How did you uh how do you get these green light bulb boxes? I'm trying out Quarto. Oh, that's like all the rage. I feel like we should have like a impromptu, not book club, but like a seminar on Quarto. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, sorry. So yeah, well, just anyway. trying out and looks interesting. So it does look interesting. Would you say how long did it take you more or less to learn how to to build something that looks like this? Um just reading a blog post, that's it. Be well, basically, if you already know our markdown, then pretty much everything transfers. Okay. Do you think or it's at least most? All right. Okay. We well, we should well we'll stay on topic, but I am I'm curious. Anyway. All right, so we'll talk about, uh, we'll maybe talk about that later. All right. So, well, I guess the first one is quite straightforward. So to calculate log odds from the probability, so first we divide um, P over one minus P and then take the log of it. Then I have minus 0 0.6. And if we have log odds and we want to convert it into probability, then we can take, um, then we can uh, run this number using the logistic function. And afterwards we get 96%. Um, so I guess this, the first two questions are quite straightforward. And afterwards, okay, now we have um, coefficient of 1.7. And what does it mean about um, change in the odds? And to do that, we just take the exponent of this value and we have 5.47, which implies that each unit change in the predictor multiplies the odds by around 5.5. I guess that's it. But so um, there is one thing though. So the odds are not symmetrical, right? No. And by that, yeah. And to me, it's, I actually like the, um, this uh, value more because to me, it seems like, yeah, you, yeah, you can easier, you, you can compare coefficients more easily in this log out space. Mm -hmm. For example, um, odds of 5.5 and 0 0.7. I mean, 0 0.7 doesn't seem a lot, but, you know, because yeah. it's just, I don't know. I guess the lack of symmetry using the odds, using the exponentiated coefficient bothers me a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess you could think about, I'm not sure this is right, but you could think about, I might regret saying this on a recording, but uh, you could think about odds of five. So we'll, let's pretend like instead of five point, well, instead of 5.47 uh, or 5.5, we'll say it's five. Maybe that, does that, would that correspond to, uh, sort of in the negative direction, would that correspond to odds of 0 0.2, right? Yeah. So that, so I guess if you can make that translation fast. Yeah, I guess. Then, uh, then that would be a way of, of thinking about it. So maybe, I, I, uh, I haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about that too deeply. I think I was in my, time as a student, I was told pretty quickly that basically beyond, so if you look at log odds, you kind of look if it's positive or negative. If you look at odds, you look at if it's a greater than one or less than one and then significance, but then to like really understand what's going on, you just go straight to simulations. I guess. Which which, yeah, which I mean, it, what, that was not at all in a, a Bayesian context, but I think that that is what um, 
McElrath also favors, just given that he talks about, um, how does he phrase it? Uh, no, no, I forget how he, what he's, he has an analogy, like a metaphor, but he talks about not really caring about um, what happens on this log odd scale instead of what happens on like real values on the probability scale, on the outcome scale. So, which I think makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't think in terms of log odds anyway. Yeah. It's a bit weird to think in that manner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, that's just a, um, I'm getting sidetracked a little bit there. Yeah. Oh, oh, you um, signed up for the medium question? I did. I don't have anything. So I don't know if I, um, let me look. So yeah, so there's a medium one. So yeah, no, I, I don't have, Okay, so I started to write something out, but then I realized I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll, I'll just, I'll do this for the benefit of uh, myself. Um, let's see if I can make it look a little bit nicer. Oh, that's taking a long time. Um, nice. Okay. Okay. Do you know if you can, I don't think you can. All right, I'm gonna do something very, all right, so this is, what you're about to see is definitely not Porto. <laughs> um, uh, well, I don't know. So, okay, so basically, um, if our independent variable is a one or zero, there are two different formats that we can analyze it. We can have the aggregated form or the disaggregated form. And, and the point is that the, um, the inference won't change, but the likelihood does change. So, so this is, uh, well, I'm not really sure uh, what we were supposed to do as far as like answering this, but, um, I mean, so in one case, the yi's are binomially distributed, where each row is going to have its own number of trials and probability of success per trial. And so I put where, so in the first one where i indexes covariate configurations versus a version where it, there is each observation has its own. Uh, has its own probability of success. And so um, I'm not really sure what we're being asked to explain why. Like, are, 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 because, so the likelihood why it changes is pretty obvious because the variable is different. In one case, y is a binomial variable. And in the other case, it's a Bernoulli variable. Uh, but the more interesting question, the one that I don't, so I, I don't know how the likelihood gets fit. like if it was if this were like a maximum likelihood class, you know, it would be an interesting exercise that I'd have to think about to show how inference doesn't change. Especially, I think one thing that would be bizarre in that class would be how um, the standard errors end up being the same between those two. Um, but anyway. So, so there's a little bit of question ambiguity here, but I guess I, in theory, I could have answered all possible questions. Um, I don't know, but do you have any, any thoughts on this one? Well, I haven't looked at this question except, well, I haven't, in fact, I haven't looked at any other question except from the one that I'm doing. So, yeah, not sure. Okay. In any case, um, so yeah, and then if we were to write out 
the likelihoods, there would be like a binomial coefficient and blah, blah, blah for these things. So, I mean, they are, they are different, um, but yeah. Um, so we, we can move on though. What's the next so, one that you have or go on? So by likelihood, it's like the normalized probability, right? Um, or yeah. Right, right. The likelihood of, okay. Yeah, so the likelihood is the probability of, well, it's the joint probability of the data. Mm -hmm. Well, I need to revisit the earlier chapter again. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Maybe I'll, well, um, a very responsible version of me would put this on in the chat later, would figure it out and put it in the chat. We'll yeah, see. I'll also think about it uh, later. Mm -hmm. You're right. All right. But anyway, um, but that's not going to happen live on this stream. Oh. So what, um, what's the next problem that do you have? You have the next problem, right? Yes. The hard one. Yeah. Part number one to be precise. Um, okay. Where is my all right? Okay. So I would say the hard one and hard two is actually not hard, not and by that. I am by no by no means bragging, but it's, for example, for the uh, part number one, it's basically just fitting the models that are already discussed in the chapter, but then now with the HMC. But anyway, so in part one, we're basically asked to fit the model again, and then afterwards. Uh, try to compare which models fits the best. Okay, and for the preparation of the data, it's all discussed in the uh, chapter. And then now I have the four models. So the first model is only using uh, is it is an intercept only model. And then the second model, now we have um, intercept plus estimate for the treatment. And then in the third model, wait. Okay, so the difference between the second and the third model is that now we're I'm using a better prior because, well, as discussed in the chapter, using this flat prior, seemingly flat prior, is actually a very bad one for a binomial model because it's highly concentrated on the ends of the uh, probability scale. Mm -hmm. I think that one is um, a nice um, reading. I, I find that I find that really nice. So and then comparing the third and the fourth model. So now in the fourth model we have um, a varying. In, so for each actor we have um, we set a separate intercept. And then after fitting the model, I can then compare. Um, the models and by the way uh, i think in the chat yesterday i mentioned something about the rms being super verbose and i think now i stand behind that statement <laughs> very much and yeah so here in this um, model comparison we can clearly see that um, model with actor specific intercept has the lowest psis which really suggests a better prediction by this model. And I think we also see the plot um, that the variance, the variation is really between the, uh, among the actors. Yeah, that's it for heart number one. 
uh yeah wow yeah those uh the other ones have have no weight basically e to the negative 33 etc not e yeah. 10 to the negative 33 um yeah wow that's uh yeah so the if i remember right it's been a few days since i read this the the actor one that's which side the actor is on right actor is not like uh is not like which chimpanzee or it's the presence of the actor right i think so yeah right because that's now now it's coming back because that's what the finding was is that humans will sort of share food if there is someone to share food with but not if there isn't so yeah so this is just saying that chimpanzees act like humans in this task if i remember correctly okay well that so so yeah so what were you um so did you try to do this in brms um no i <laughs> i don't even bother well i only tried um the first two mm -hmm. But even with that, it's I, I find it quite a lot. And I just switched to um, Ulam in the thinking. And it's also because, not only because it's um, less for both, but I find that the, um, the way the generative model is formulated fits very well with um, well, one with the book and also with other uh, Bayesian statistics materials that I see online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say something in favor of, so I, I had quite a, I mean, uh, the same thoughts as, as Laura about sort of an apprehension or uh, maybe um, almost a disappointment with rethinking is that it seems it's like a, a toy package right so it's a package it's, yeah it's, toy, it's a pedagogical package i think it's the best way to, to put it uh, or the best way i can come up with to put it but uh the nice thing about it is that i feel like it's slowly getting us to use stan which is you know a kind of the package so so that's why i've i've stuck out or i've kept on the path with um, yeah. rethinking functions is because my end goal is to use Stan where I can. So. Yeah, and if I remember, if I understand correctly, the way this part is written in Stan is quite similar, right? I think so. I haven't, the only um, other Bayesian model fitting um, framework I've used is JAGS and RJAGS, um, which is is kind of weird. It, it's really weird to write. I don't know if you've ever used it, but it's a it's you're you end up writing like string. Basically you save your model to a text file and there are four hmm. loops. It's a very strange, it's a very strange thing. Okay. Anyway, but we, we're not gonna talk about RJAGS hopefully. Um, but okay. It looks like you you did that very successfully. All right. So um, the hard number two. So that is. So we are using the eagles data from the mass library, and in this data, it's describing. So it's a story of thieving eagles, and it. Um, characterizes if um, so for the eagles we can so you can have either small or large eagle and then as well as the whether the eagle is immature or or already an adult and what it tries to uh, see is that for example if we have an adult large eagle what's it's um, probability of success to thief the salmon from another eagle. So I guess, yep. Yeah. So I'll just go down a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, there are this 
all possible combinations of the covariates. And by the covariates, it's just uh, the thieving combination of the characteristic of the thieving eagle and the victim eagle. Mm -hmm. So it's about, for example, here, a large and adult eagle will have a high probability of success if it's stealing from a small eagle and so on. So it's just a com combination of all this um, characteristic of the eagles. And yeah, so first of all, just making the um, the binary of the dummy variable for the um, for the covariates. And honestly, when I'm just using the uh, linear model in R, I have I have actually never used a binary variable. I only have a factor variable and then let R do everything for me. So I guess this sort of new to me, but yeah, I guess it's just how much I've taken what R did underneath um, for granted. But anyway, so here in this model, I'm just uh, fit, uh, fitting the model with, the, with an intercept and then um, whether the pirate eagle is large or not, and then whether the victim eagle is large or not. So for the victim eagle, there's no uh, information whether the victim is adult or immature. So either just large or small. And then for the again for the pirate eagle, whether it's um, a so a is adult. Um, so it's just an indicator whether it's an adult or immature. And then I use the uh, recommended prior. So um, the norm 0, 0.1.5 for the intercept and 0, 0, 0.5 for the coefficients. And then I then compare the model estimate um, of uh, if I fit the model using the quadratic approximation or with the HMC. And I just so one quick, yeah. one quick question. Yeah, sure. So, so the intercept then is an interaction with a small pirate, small victim, child pirate. Yes. Well, is it an interaction though? I guess just a probability of success uh, for a small immature eagle trying to steal from a small eagle. Yeah. Yeah, no, no I, I think that's, that has to be right. It's just interesting because, you know, he normally doesn't like that type of um, model where one, I guess one cell is the intercept and the other cells are um, yeah. modifications of that. But I, I guess it's good to do it in the different ways. Yeah. Huh. And now the model seems like indexing the combination of the covariates. That's uh, what I find quite interesting because in the, um, in the data, there's only, I think eight rows or very few rows because this is an aggregated binomial um, data. Mm -hmm. So really this model is sort of indexing the combination of the covariates. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I think I, yep. Yeah. Okay. So if we compare the estimates um, using the Quap and the Ulam, well, I would say that the estimates are quite comparable. So let's say here, so Q is Quap and U is with the Ulam. So for the intercept, 0 0 0.29 and 0 0.28. Yeah, it's 1.62, 1.65 here, and negative 1.67, negative 1.7, negative 0 0.65. Oh, so not negative, 0 0.65 and 0 0.67. I would say it's quite comparable. It's pretty comparable. However, if you're using this crazy prior or flat prior, um, then 
the estimates become very different, which, and also not only different between uh, these two, also very different from what we have here. So it's uh, like here, the estimate for the uh, uh, beta P, we have 1.65, so 1.6 ish. And now it's on the scale of 4.4 or five. So for both of them, it's actually, they have a very far estimate compared to if we have um, the recommend, if you're using the recommended prior. Wow. Yeah. That's super wild. Okay. So the beta for P and V. Uh, what was what was beta P? Beta P is um so it's for whether the pirate, pirate is large. large or not. Okay, and victim large. Yeah. Okay, so it really so if you were to just fit those models with the extremely wide priors, you would think that size is extremely important. Size of the yeah. eagle. Oh wow. What is interesting though, is that the wide priors do have consistent effects. Like those two yeah. models that are currently on your screen are not, I mean, they're substantively saying the same thing, even though they're, the magnitudes are kind of different. Wow. Yeah. But it's because, I think it's really because this flat prior is actually, well, uh, what in a uh, linear model, uh, Gaussian linear model of flat prior is not really flat in the log of space, right? Yeah. And then everything becomes very confusing. It does become very confusing, but that's uh, super cool that you were able to use our show. I mean, cause yeah, he does have that in the chapter, um, but then to, to show it here too. Okay. And then afterwards, it's about um, interpreting the estimate. So, um, okay. Okay, so first I'm just taking uh, the intercept here. And yeah, so the intercept is the probability of success for immature small pirates on small victims. And on average, we expected around 56% uh, chance of success. And if the pirate is large, then whether, if, even if it's immature, then the success rate or proportion of success will reach almost 90%. So I think size is a very important uh, part here, especially if you look at the size of the, oh, not this one, uh, size of the coefficient, then I think it's, um, yeah, it also fits what we're seeing here. Yeah, yeah. That's right. All right. And then afterwards, uh, so for this binomial model, to visualize the posterior, we can either have the proportion or the counts. And by count, it's the number of um, so we can visualize the observed number of attempts. So instead of normalizing by the total cases, we're just um, uh, visualizing and estimating the row counts. And by uh, counts here, it's the um, number of successful attempt by the pirate eagle to steal salmon from the victim eagle. So at, whereas on the left here, we are seeing the proportion of success. So it, as you can see, everything is normalized be, between the range of zero and one because it's on a probability scale. And I would say for some model, it fits very well, but obviously for this one and this one, well, for a lot of, yeah. I think I, I have to say only for a few uh, combinations, it 
it can predict really well, like this one and this one, and the rest, it's very far off. But what I find quite interesting is that if you're just visualizing the counts, it's not that easy to say whether uh, the estimate is way off or not. Because here, for example, we have to observe counts here and we have the estimates here. So, well, even though it's not that great, but at least the count here is still within the interval of the point range. Whereas if we look at the corresponding um, visualization in the proportion of success here, so here SAS, SAS, it's actually very far, quite far off. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, in, in this case, I'm trying to think, I, I feel like if it's, you know, it's hard to imagine, but if I try to imagine a situation where you only showed one of those at a time, I think if I were to see proportion success, I would say that's a pretty bad model. Yeah. And if I were to see count success, I would say it's not a great model because oftentimes the observed counts fall kind of far out into the plausible distribution. In fact, most of the time, very only in two cases yeah. really yeah. do they fall kind of close. But it's just much more apparent, I think. That, <laughs> huh. So um, I don't know if you were part of the like a uh, assignment was to think about it, but is there any indication of why this might not be a, a good model given in the problems? Um, oh, interaction. Well, yes, not <laughs> include the interaction. Well, I, unfortunately, I didn't um, make the um, visualization. I think I'll do it after this one. So here I'm just um, including interaction um, for the pirates. So if the pirate is large and an adult, will it improve the probability of success? And it actually does. So, but then, yeah, I'm quite curious actually whether this, um, well, obviously here, oh no. Um, so I'm comparing M2, the yeah, WAIC is higher. I should have uh, ESIS well, but the weight here is higher with the first model anyway. Mm. So it's not that big of an improvement. It did um, let's see the model one dot u that just means it's fit with Ulam as opposed yeah. to Quap. Quap, I see. Okay. Uh, can you go back down just a little bit? Uh, although I guess down to the very bottom to the oh yeah. I guess if we were doing hypothesis testing, we would not say that. Well, we would say there's you know quite a bit of you know there's 32, 33 percent of the 89, 89 percent mass plausibility mass that's below zero. So. Hmm. Wow, well, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess by looking at this, I mean, uh, if you're just looking at the coefficients, then, well, especially for the, um, for all of the coefficients, actually, these are significant. But then if I look at this prediction, it's very, I would say it's quite disappointing, but then, yeah. So what, what looks like happens, as, I mean, the substantive thing is notice that with the proportion success, the, with the exception of like the one that is with the two, no, just the one that is like perfectly predicted. Yeah. But the point estimate is the true count, which, Okay, so I, I was going to say that was the intercept, but that's not the intercept. Anyway. No, yeah. this one is the intercept. Yeah. So anyway, but with the exception of that, the, the way that the, the prediction is always wrong is that it's not extreme enough. 
it's not far enough away from 0.5. Yeah. Uh, as I said, it's almost true. It's true for everyone except for the very last one, the intercept, where it's predicting above 50%, and then it's actually 25% for the very last one. It's like the estimates are, the prediction are being pulled toward the middle. Because uh -huh. here it's uh, it's more toward the 0 0.5, also here. So the R is always in that reverse direction. Mm -hmm. hmm. Wow, that's, that's, that's interesting. I wonder if we'll, um, well, yeah, I was gonna say, I wonder if we'll come back to this one when we do hierarchical models, but maybe, that's quite interested in that, but yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe we have egos in different areas. Uh huh. Okay. Well, right. um, that was. Let's that was, move on. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, well, I'll just share my R Studio. So this is. Uh, the fourth hard problem. Um, so this, I guess, just for context, I can make this a little bigger. Um, yes, okay, I can. Um, I'm trying to think what to say for context. For context, this is like, um, there's this US University of California, Santa Barbara, USCB, no, U UCSB. Anyway, there's this famous data set on um, discrimination in admissions at the University of California, I think at Santa Barbara. Uh, any case, the, um, he found a data set that has a very similar structure um, and it's in the, the package. I guess I can, I don't know exactly what this will do in this mode. Interesting, okay. Um, so it's an aggregated set where we have a uh, number of applications. So it's basically like you have, you have chemical sciences and then you have the number of applications and then the number of awards, and then it's disaggregated by uh, sex of the app or gender of the applicant. And then you have it for, I believe, six different disciplines. So uh, what is that? Distinct. I guess it's, I always get unique and distinct to mix up. Uh, okay, yeah, chemical sciences, physical, physics, humanities, technical sciences, and yeah, anyway, so those. So, um, and then so what we're supposed to do in this is basically imagine that there's some direct effect of gender on probability of getting an award but there's also an indirect effect through discipline. Uh, and that, that's the classic. So the, the UCSB data set, I'm gonna keep calling it that even though I don't, I'm only 90, I'm 70 sure that's what it is. That's the classic finding is that what happened was that there was not any direct, so the, the, basically the UCSB data set found that if anything, the effect of gender was to make women more likely to be accepted, but it looked like that was not the case because women were applying to harder disciplines. So the total effect of gender was to lower the probability of being admitted in that case. That was not awards, but it was admitted. Um, so the total effect was to reduce your probability, but because you were trying to get into a harder program. So that's like this classic finding. So, um, and it's uh, also a main example of Simpson's paradox, which was discussed, seems like now forever ago in the book. Um, in any case, um, let me see if there's anything I'm missing. So yeah, basically, oh, UCB. Okay, so maybe it's not Santa Barbara, it's some other UCB, no. Anyway, so what are the total and indirect causal effects so consider a mediation path, draw the DAG, that's what was down there below. Um, and so, and then there's some kind of practical questions. Well, there's the final theoretical question, what's your causal interpretation? 
then there's the question, if the NWO is the um, Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, uh, if, the NDO, if the NWO's goal is to equalize, blah, blah, blah. Okay, first the model. Um, so this is pretty standard stuff where we have awards are binomially distributed based on number of applications and theta or P. And then so theta, I start off just by modeling. So this is the one way to get the total effect is, so I'm, I'm not including discipline in this one. Um, and then I have, and then I fit it and then below, I'm going to fit the um, model with where the probability well, the mm -hmm. log odds of, uh, you know, the log odds of being accepted are gonna be a function of both um, being a man or woman and the discipline. So yeah, I've actually already fit these, so there's no need to fit them again. Um, but if we do this, and so, so here they're fit, extracted samples from the posterior, um, subtract, so let's see if I can do, so oh, this, oh, okay, didn't work as I had hoped. Um, so anyway, so what this is, uh, the A parameters are here. So, um, so this is, you can see they're they're very similar. So because these are just like the different intercepts. So I mean, one thing is that. And what that, does the intercept here means? Oh, sorry to cut the. Uh -huh. No, it's just the intercept. So, so for example, uh, if I take, I'm just gonna do this. So this one, and I take, um, if I do, that means uh, that th like here, there would be the average woman has a 15% chance. So that's what those are, because okay. all there are are two intercepts. Um, yeah. And so, um, so that's that. And so now what I do is if I subtract the second column from the first column to get a contrast. So from this that I, I just showed. So if I subtract these from this, um, you know, so we can think about this mm -hmm. if, the men are one. So if men have a higher probability, so this is kind of what we would think about as a, you know, if the direct effect, no, if the total effect of, how should we put it, of being a, so it's not a dummy variable, so we can pick which, which one we want. Uh, if the effect of being a man is to have a higher um, probability, this number, number one will be higher. So subtracting off two will still result in a positive, positive number. Anyway, so that's where this diff A comes from. And then um, there are, I'm not sure why there are two functions in his package for rethinking. There's the inverse logit and there's also logistic, but they're the same function. The logistic is the inverse logit. Um, in any case, so this is one thing that he talks about throughout the chapter is, so this gets us the differences, that, so the contrast on the logit scale, whereas this gets us the contrast on the probability scale. So, um, so we can look at this in his own sort of summary function. Um, and man, the output just doesn't, oh. doesn't look good there. Uh, I'm gonna switch back to, um, the not visual editor. So, um, so here's here's what we get. So in both cases, there is an advantage to to there's the total effect of being a man is is positive. So on the logit scale, it's you know you have a mean of 0.21, and uh, and consistently above zero for most of the probability mass in the posterior. Uh, and then if we wanted to know like, okay, so what is my percentage point increase, right? Uh, it seems to be three, three percentage points higher. So, uh, so there's that, so that's, that's that model. Um, and then now if 
I want to do the same thing. It looks like I didn't, I did something different, but just for comparison, if, let's see, if I wanna look at these samples, so I have this, um, I called it NWO fit. Um, and I need to get the samples from it. So, all right, yeah. I was just trying to remember why I called it no D for no, uh, no, no, uh, no discipline. So I take that and okay, so that's there already. So what does it look like when we do this? I guess I'll just overwrite these. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't know why diff p did not appear. Yeah, I think you have to include it in list, right? Uh, the... I'm trying to think, I, maybe, what did I do? Oh, yes, you're, you're right. Okay. Oh, and that's why you have to title them. All right. Oh. All right, um, so now what happens? I mean, there's still, um, the, the effect is attenuated slightly. That's, so it's not like this classic reversal effect, mm -hmm. but it, it, is, it is reduced. Anyway, so uh, that was a fun exercise. Um, I'm not gonna get into the post check because one of the things I wanted to do real quick, hmm, all this has been reformatted bizarrely. Is so, so he has this, and there's a really nice section in the book on a very parallel example. So what he has us imagine is that we, that there's an unobserved confounder. So if I had been better about, if I knew how to use Daggety, I would have known how to like put a circle around this um, to show that. St so stage is unobserved, but the idea is that stage uh, affects discipline and it's sort of a weird, you know, if you want to look at this afterward, I would encourage it. It's a weird idea of how stage affects discipline. In fact, I'll just highlight that for a second. He says, suppose that in some disciplines, junior scholars apply for most of the grants. In other disciplines, scholars from all career stages compete. Um, so as a result, career stage influences discipline as well as the probability of uh, being awarded a grant. So I interpreted that as stage having a direct effect on awards, which makes sense because you probably have more prior awards and I don't know, you have just more experience, but it also has an effect through discipline. Now, it's weird to me to think about this because it doesn't state, doesn't change your discipline, right? Um, so that's kind of a weird thing to think about. It seems actually more like discipline influences stage in this particular causal network. So that's one of the things that I, I really wish there was like a answer sheet for these. Cause I just want to know like what, this to me doesn't make any sense but it's very clearly from the language. I mean, it says career stage influences discipline as well as the probability. Like it's very clearly the language he uses. Yeah. But it just seems like if he, if he didn't say that and he described the situation without kind of that summary statement it seems like this would be going the other way, discipline influences stage. Um, so that's something I really don't know what to, I don't know what to make of that, but we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, so I just kept with this. So basically he wants us to know, um, or wants us to think about, well, okay. So just basically long story short, the way he presents this in the book is that discipline is now a collider variable. So this is towards the beginning of the chapter, I think, where um, it's not it's not stage in this case, but ability, uh, sort of academic ability is it's in a different causal network, um, and so the idea is that if we condition, so we don't observe stage, but then we go ahead and um, condition on discipline, which it seems like we should do, then what's going to happen is we're going to get a biased um, we're going to get a biased output 
or a biased rendering of what genders affect on awards. That's the idea. Because we're because in our okay. model, we're conditioned. So it's a lot of information. Again, it looks great. But so here's what I thought was really fun. And I wish we did more of uh, and maybe we do, maybe we just haven't, we haven't done those problems. But he has us do, or he says, um, let's, oh no, that's me. He says, if you're having trouble thinking this through, try running a simulation on, try simulating fake data, assuming your DAG is true, then analyzing using the model from the problem. So, so this was actually like a really fun thing to think through where um, basically like, so one minute. So, you know, so there are six disciplines. So draw six numbers from a random uniform. So, sorry, from a zero to one uniform, right? And those will be men's probability of being in those disciplines, draw six. And that'll be for any given woman, that'll be her probability. So there are different probabilities, right? So that's how we, so this is the effect of gender on discipline. I hard coded in discrimination. So, because uh, I figured that, you know, is given that counterintuitive things might be happening, that might be the best, might be best to go with a intuitive situation. Randomly picked 760 sample size, seemed large, but not so large that everything would be significant. Um, and then basically just kind of went about creating a, a data set where there are men and women who are approximately 50 50, um, drew disciplines for them based on the prob probabilities that are coded up here. Um, got like betas for the discipline so that they'll have an effect on the probability of getting an award, uh, made stage beta. So the higher you are in your, the more senior you are, the more likely it is that you'll, anyway, so I did all this and long story short or long story medium length, no matter how many times I, I, I run it, so it's just, no, again, I didn't have time. I, I maybe did have time, but I ended up not doing it in uh, Ulam. I just did it in GLM. It shouldn't change anything like to this, this particular part where all, so there are certain things that are observed and certain things that are not. If I do, if I look at my data set, um, I tried to code. So if it's male or female, that's observed. So that's the suffix OBS. The discipline is also observed. The stage is unobserved. I guess in theory, it's observable. Negative numbers don't have any specific meaning. I, to myself, I thought they could be grad students. Uh, discipline effect is unobserved. So we observe the discipline, but we don't observe the differential rates of the discipline. Like this is the discipline effect. This is something we'll be estimating. Um, in any case, um, hmm. so, so basically, um, the, the issue is that I end up not, I, I keep, and I, I feel like what I was supposed to do was not have, find this, but I keep getting pretty accurate estimates for, I guess, the raw effect of, uh, of gender, which is, which is, I feel like something has gone wrong. Um, but, but yeah, so I mean, I can just, I just keep doing this. So I, I, you know, and I do it again and sure enough, I get a negative effect. Um, and it's always, and so, so the thing is that the, oops, there it is again. And so, and it's always negative, significant, and about ballpark, same magnitude. And so it's really just this discrepancy is that it's picking up. So that men have, uh, so th these are on the, the logit scale. So I guess if there were a dummy parameter, it would be one. And so here, what it's picking up is that the difference between the two is yeah. negative one. So the effect, so, so it's always picking up a pretty accurate estimate, which I always, anyway, I'll have to go back and think about this. It was really fun, but it's kind of disappointing in the end. I feel like I'm not getting the result that he wanted me to get. But simulation is fun. That's my, out. Oh, that's my feeling at the end. Hmm. I guess I have to try it before. You should try it. I want someone else to try it. And I feel like, 
I, I feel like Kent is now not going to try it. He did a simulation earlier, uh, like way, way long time ago that I appreciated. Uh, but anyway, we're over time. Um, yeah. But no, it's fun. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, more, to more models next week. Yeah, a lot of models, a lot of decks. <laughs> yeah, and I find it nice that the, um, well, even though I haven't personally worked on it, but the um, later number for the heart problems are really more about the modeling choice, not really about, you know, making a very complex model and then try to interpret uh, the things, but then to really uh, make sense of the model, whatever, um, even, as simple as it is. Yeah. yeah. I find that quite nice, actually. Yeah, the only thing I, and it's kind of, it's something that you alluded to earlier, is that I, I wish there were like a pre-hard where it was kind of like where you're supposed to rerun models from the chapter. Because sometimes the hard ones are not hard because they're really just making a very small modification that he explicitly yeah. told to make. Those or maybe they should just be mediums, but I feel like they're getting ready. I pretty hard because they're kind of like getting you ready to um, run the models. Yeah, I think the hard one obviously should be a medium um, exercise, not a hard one. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. It's been fun. I will. I'll be in. I'll be in Slack. All right. Then yeah, I'll try to work on what you have work on. All right. I will okay. see you around and I'll see, I guess I'll see you next week. Yeah, see you next week. Bye.